Hello everyone and welcome back to English with Kaylee. Um, I'm really, really happy to record this video for you today. It is the highly requested analysis of Anniversary by Ted Hughes. So without further ado, let's get on into the video. So as always, I just want to point out that I've got resources for all 15 of the CAIE poems from Ted Hughes's collection. You can find them on my TESS account and my Teachers Pay Teachers account um, and links will be in the description below. So without further ado, let's start reading Anniversary. My mother in her feathers of flame grows taller. Every May 13th, I see her with her sister Miriam. I lift the torn off diary page where my brother jotted Ma died today, and there they are. She is now as tall as Miriam. In the perpetual Sunday morning of everlasting, they are strolling together, listening to the larks ringing in their orbits, the work of the cosmos, creation and destruction of matter and of antimatter, pulses and flares, shudders and fades like the northern lights in their feathers. My mother is telling Miriam about her life, which was mine. Her voice comes piping down a deep gorge of woodland echoes. This is the waterline dark on my dress, look, where I dragged him from the reservoir. And that is the horse on which I galloped through the brick wall and out over the heather simply to bring him a new pen. This is the pen I laid on the altar. And these are the mass marriages of him and his brother where I was not once a guest. Then suddenly she is scattering the red coals with her fingers to find where I had fallen for the third time. She laughs helplessly till she weeps. Miriam, who died at 18, is Madonna-like, with pure white to hear of all she missed. Now my mother shows her the rosary prayers of unending worry, like pairs of shoes or one dress after another. This is the sort of thing, she is saying, I liked to wear best, and much of it, you know, was simply sitting at the window, watching the horizon. Truly wonderful it was, day after day, knowing they were somewhere. It still is. Look. And they pause on the brink of the starry dew, they are looking at me, my mother darker with her life, her red Indian hair, her skin so strangely olive and otherworldly, Miriam now sheer flame beside her. Their feathers throb softly, iridescent. My mother's face is glistening as if she held it into the skyline wind looking towards me. I do this for her. She is using me to tune finer her weeping love for my brother through mine, as if I were the shadow cast by this approach. As when I came a mile over fields and walls towards her and found her weeping for him, able for all that distance to think me him. So it's an incredibly lengthy poem. That's why I've left it until the very end. Do stick around for the entire analysis because I'll go through the thematic concerns, a detailed analysis of each stanza, um, and we'll also end with form, meter, rhyme, and as always, an essay question. Before we do that, we've got to consider the, the context of the poem. And there's some key information that we need to know um, in order to be able to, to make sense um, of, of the poem as a whole. So this poem was published towards the end of Hughes's life um, and we witness him reflecting on his life, relationships and childhood memories. 
So Edith Hughes, this is Ted Hughes's mother, is the poem's focus and the poem is an elegy to her memory. So she always supported his work as a writer and often encouraged him to write as a young boy. And she was also, like Hughes, a believer in the afterlife. Um, she herself believed that her sister Miriam would appear as an angel in her bedroom at the foot of her bed. Um, and so the depiction of Edith and Miriam as these angelic figures in the poem is, is possibly a nod to his mother's psychic beliefs. And as we know, that's also true of, of Ted Hughes as well um, and his own beliefs of the, the transcendent life. Hughes and his first wife, Sylvia Plath, married without the presence of Hughes's family. Um, and this was something that really upset his mother. And we see reference to it uh, in, the, in the poem. Um, and she, sadly, she died in 1969, a year before Hughes married Carol Orchard. So just some background information for you there. And now let's just talk about the summary. So what happens in Anniversary? So Hughes describes looking back at one of his brother's diary entries on the day that their mother passed away um, and, and a vision of his mother appears, one that he says visits every year on the anniversary of her death. So her image and that of her sister Miriam appear to him in a string of dreamlike scenarios, uh, mixing Hughes's memories with natural imagery and religious symbols. So Edith is seen sharing memories of her life with her sister Miriam, um, including the time that she dragged him, being Hughes, from the reservoir and her sadness at not receiving an invite to Hughes's wedding to Sylvia. And then Hughes goes on to describe the sisters as vivid angelic figures um, and they begin to fade and we see that reflected in the stanza structure towards the end. The poem ends with Hughes exploring Edith's feelings towards her son um, and, and it, ends on, it ends on almost a, a sour note um, as we see this, this kind of sibling rivalry and jealousy uh, between Hughes and his brother Gerald, uh, believing that he lived in the shadow of his brother and his mother favourited him. Okay, so in terms of, of themes, the semantic concerns, um, this is obviously a very complex and challenging elegy um, and it explores themes of childhood, family and spirituality through Hughes's memory of his mother. So we encounter themes of family, spirituality and again this transcendental, the transcendental ideas um, and finally, and I think this is a beautiful uh, statement in itself, the landscape of memory. We know how important nature is to Hughes, him growing up um, in the valleys of Yorkshire and, and the importance it plays in a number of his, of his poems. And here we see the two come together, this idea of nature and memories um, and spirituality um, and, and how that, that is interwoven into into this memory of Hughes of Hughes's mother. Okay, um, so this is a very this is going to be a very very detailed detailed analysis. Um, I don't believe there's anything like this uh, online. So do stick around. Um, and if there are things that you think of that you can add to it, do feel free to pop them in the comments below. Um. Um, and especially when the, when the video goes live, I'm going to be hanging around in comments um, and answering questions. So we start, let's get straight into stanza one. The first sentence here, my mother in her flames, in her feathers of flames. So from the offset, we have this beautiful imagery, we get this sense of these wings of an angel. Um, and this is really used to establish the motif of light and fire. Um, and and we, we get this vivid and dynamic appearance of Hughes's vision. And this is, of course, emphasized by the, the alliteration of the F. We see the mum growing taller and, and this comparative adjective shows how the image strengthens um, for, for not only for the reader, but for the speaker as well. 
every May 13th. And that's where we get the reference to the title of the poem, um, which is the anniversary of Hughes's mum's uh, passing. So throughout the first stanza, we have quite a lot, actually not just within the first stanza, on John Munt is used uh, throughout the poem at, at different points. Um, and, and here it's used as the story and the vision appear. So as he lifts the torn off page of the diary, as he puts himself back into that moment, um, that's when, when his mother appears. And, and the stanza ends with, and there they are, this very declarative, affirmative sentence. And that allows us to consider this is more than a passing memory. It's, they're almost tangible in front of him, um, which again gives us this idea of the vibrancy with full of life and movement. Okay. So in stanza two, this is where we see Hughes using cosmic imagery to describe his mother and her sister Miriam. And this is where the lines start to become blurred between factual memories, as we'll move on to see examples of in the next stanza, and the spiritual visions of his mother. And again, that continues into stanza three also. She is now as tall as Miriam. So from the very offset of the second stanza, we see this clarity uh, from, from the speaker, um, which also allows the reader to have a very clear image in their minds also. In the perpetual Sunday morning of everlasting, we have an interesting paradox here because we have this, this idea of the fixed day being Sunday um, and the everlasting. And, and this goes to show how this memory is frozen eternally in Hughes's mind. Um, and this also starts to hint at the complexities um, of, of the poem in its entirety of the relationship that they shared um, and, and the complexity in, in revisiting the life of somebody that we've lost in terms of the, the happiness we feel in celebrating life, but also the, the regret and sadness that, that comes with what if and what could have happened. So throughout the poem, Hughes uses a number of dynamic verbs in the present tense. Again, this creates this idea of these active, vigorous figures um, that, that are, again, almost tangible. The work of the cosmos, creation and destruction of matter and of antimatter. So this is that first time where we start to see this cosmic imagery at play, um, language that is usually associated with physics and astronomy, um, very much fact or fiction, and this being this being fact. Um, so, so a beautiful weave here of nature and science and religion and spirituality, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Creation and destruction of matter. So we've got these contrasting nouns here, um, which could be used as a reference to the cycle of life and death, or an idea that both his mother and aunt are now in a place that's beyond the powers of our natural world, something Hughes explores in a number of his poems, including the ones tested in the CAIE syllabus. So the stanza ends with a simile like the northern lights in their feathers. Um, now, the northern lights, they are an atmospheric event that can be witnessed near to the North Pole. If you don't know what it is, um, it's well worth looking up a few pictures. And in this event, the night sky seems to appear in, in sheets of, of changing colours, very frequently greens and blues. Um, it's known for having a huge spiritual impact on visitors and those that go to witness the event. Um, and this allows that connection with his mother's appearance to both that, the natural world um, and also that, that spiritual world and experience also. Okay, so now we're going to get into the larger stanza, stanza three. Um, I've actually had to split this into three separate slides just because it's so incredibly long. Um, so stick with me, we'll get there together in the end. So 
in the third stanza, Hughes is Hughes describes his mother, um, and 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 we see her voice come to life actually as she speaks to to her sister. So my mother is telling Miriam about her life, which was mine. Um, two possible interpretations here. The first being that, you know, how a mother's life is dedicated to her family and sons and how their lives overlapped um, when Hughes was born. Um, you know, you, you, the role of the mother and the importance of it. Or it can also be Hughes's desire to to, to own his mother through his memories of her or as a way to, to hold on to something that they share. Down a deep gorge of woodland echoes. Um, now we see Hughes reference the woodlands and the valleys frequently in his works. Um, and, and this almost seems to be a symbol of memory itself. Um, you know, we see the mother, you know, standing above the, the, the horizon, looking out and observing, um, which, which hints at the views from their hilltop home um, in Yorkshire, in Hempstonstall. Uh, and this is, interestingly, it's the same viewpoint um, in Wind and Football at Slack. If you haven't read my analysis of those, um, of those poems, I'll link them just above for you. And that consonance here of that plosive D and the assonance of O and E also shows the strength and the power not only of the vision, um, but of her words in them coming piping down, um, but also a, as a, an introduction to the actions that, that she took throughout her life for her, for her sons, um, and in particular, Ted. So then we actually do see the mother's voice. Um, so the mother's direct voice here allows for her perspective to be shared. This is the water line dark on my dress where I dragged him from the reservoir. And that is the horse on which I galloped to take him the pen. However, there's a pattern here, not only in this, in this part of stanza three, but later on also of demonstratives using this and that and these. Um, and that creates almost a detached register and tone um, to, to the mother's voice. And that adds to, to the dreamlike nature of the poem as a, as a whole. Um, to bring him a new pen, this is the pen I laid on the altar. Um, so we here we have an allusion to religious faith. Um, so here, the, the pen itself symbolizing Hughes's life as a writer. Um, Edith Hughes supported and encouraged um, at Hughes's work wholeheartedly, um, and even as a young child. Um, but, but we see this section here where it says, I laid on the altar. And here we have this very strong religious significance, um, you know, the altar being where sacrifice is made. Um, and that could be to reference the one made by her mother to support her son. Um, and that's referenced earlier on. This is the horse on which I galloped through the brick wall. Um, this could very much be a metaphor for obstacles and things uh, she, she overcame in order to, to support, her, support her son. And these are the mass marriages of him and his brother, where I was not once a guest. Um, of course, we, we have that contextual knowledge um, that when he was married Sylvia Plath, his mum wasn't invited along with, along with other members of his family. And we get this sense of, of disappointment, um, especially after all she had done and all she's, she's listed um, in, in the stanza. But this could also be a hint at Hughes's regret for not inviting her. So again, going back to that complexity of when we when we look back on someone's life, we, we look at the enjoyment of their life, but also our own regrets and sorrow. So I think there's another layer to that one there. Then suddenly, so we have a falter here, but it's within the same stanza. Um, she being, uh, um, sorry, Edith Hughes, she is scattering the red coals with her fingers. So once again, we've got the motif of fire and the intensity of the vision. 
But more importantly, there's a biblical reference here. Um, it's from the, the prophet Ezekiel. So Ezekiel saw an angel of God scattering burning coals over Jerusalem. Um, and this was an act of purification through destruction. Having Edith here scatter the coals, we see her purify the sins and mistakes that Hughes has made. For example, in the previous sentence, like not inviting her to his wedding. To where I had fallen for the third time. I haven't put this in, I haven't included it, but um, if we do consider the uh, marriage um, and we know that Hughes had three relationships, two of them obviously very unsuccessful, um, sadly ending, uh, ending in, in the death of his first wife, Sylvia Plath, and his, his second partner, um, Asia Weevil, as well. There may be some link there that you could make. She laughs helplessly till she weeps. Um, so it's just that contrast again. So we spoke about paradox, and here we can see that emotional contrast. Um, and it, it mixes life's enjoyment and happiness uh, with, of course, this, you know, sorrowful regret of, of what if, um, and not just from, from Edith's side and Miriam's, but also Ted himself. And this really captures the, the conflicting and difficult emotion that one can encounter when looking back on the life of a lost loved one. So the stanza goes on to describe Miriam. So Miriam, who died at 18, is Madonna-like with pure wonder to hear of all she'd missed. Um, so Madonna-like is a reference to the Virgin Mary, um, who was, of course, the mother of Christ and a, a predominant figure of worship. So we get this association and connotation of purity and innocence. Um, and of course, we we can we can extend this by saying that since Miriam died when she was eighteen, um, it suggests how Edith is now showing her the parts of her life that she didn't get to witness, sadly. So, in Edith moving to the afterlife, we we see Miriam blossom and learn um, also. Shows her the rosary prayers of unending worry. So rosary beads are are, are used um, in a place of worship. Um, so here again, so we've got another religious um, reference and illusion. And, and here we see that, that a mother's love and care for their children never truly leave them in that unending worry. It doesn't go away. Okay, we're nearly at the end of stanza three. We, we, we're getting there. Um, so stanza three continues um, again with, with Edith's voice. This is the sort of thing she says I liked to wear best and much of it, you know, was simply sitting at the window watching the horizon. So we, we find comfort in, in the connection between the sisters and, and this suggests that their reunion in the afterlife is one of love and happiness. Wonderful it was, day after day, knowing they were somewhere. It still is. Look. So we see a shift here from the past tense was to the present is. Um, and, and this is a, a really endearing point within the poem because it highlights how Edith is going to continue to watch over um, uh, Ted um, in, in the afterlife as she is seen looking towards him at the end of the next stanza. And that standalone word there with look really emphasizes that, that that, that protection um, will always remain. Okay, and now we move into stanza four. After the, the detailed analysis, we'll look at the form meter and rhyme. So, so stick around for that bit. So at the beginning of stanza four, we see Miriam and Edith pausing on the brink of the starry dew. They are looking at me. So the stanza length actually starts to do decrease here as the two begin to fade from view. Um, and Hughes takes the poem in another direction. Uh, the syntactical field here of the starry dew and iridescent 
uh, lends itself to this idea of, of fading. My mother's face is glistening as if she held it into the skyline wind. Um, and, and once again, we're brought back to this idea of nature and how it serves as a backdrop to his mother's image and weaves in elements of, of true memory into that spiritual experience. And that's where that semantic concern of the landscape of memory uh, comes in. Okay, um, and let's just take a look at the final two stanzas, the shortest stanzas, uh, made up of three lines each, so tercets. Um, so stanza five, we see here, um, this the the poem takes a it takes a, a turn um, and now looks at the relationship between uh, Hughes and his brother Gerald um, and and his perceived their perceived relationship from from Hughes's perspective. So the final stanza explores a complex relationship between Hughes and his older brother Gerald. Um, she is using me to find to tune finer her weeping love for my brother through mine. So she's using my, our relationship as a tool to, to perfect the relationship that she has with, with Gerald, their older, his older sibling. As when I came a mile over fields and walls towards her and found her weeping for him, able for all that distance to think me him. So here we get a, a, a possible real childhood memory in which Hughes's mother mistook Hughes for Gerald. Um, and, and this obviously implies that Gerald was favoured by Hughes's mother. Um, and, and I haven't highlighted it, but of course the, the repetition of weeping for him shows that deep impact that it's had on Hughes um, and his thoughts on their relationship. Um, and then just to, to wrap up on those, those two stanzas there, um, we get the sense that Hughes felt like he lived in the shadow quotation of his brother and was seen as, as inferior in the eyes of his mother. So again, it all comes back to that complexity of relationships, familiar relationships, uh, sibling relationships. Okay, let's talk about form, meter and rhyme. So there are, of course, six stanzas of varying lengths that shift focus. Uh, the first stanza of the poem explore descriptions of Edith and Miriam, while stanza three focuses on the mother's voice and her experiences. Um, and the poem's final stanzas add complexity to their relationship as it discusses Hughes's sibling relationship and that perceived favoritism of Hughes's brother, Gerald. Meter, it's written in free verse, so no set meter is used. However, Hughes uses techniques such as end stop lines and enjambment interchangeably for effect. And rhyme, we know no rhyme scheme is used. However, the lack of regular structural features and rhyme patterns allows for this free flowing stream of various memories and that incorporation of fragments of different images and ideas to be used very successfully. And the last one, as always, I will leave you with an essay question, um, which we can discuss down below. So the essay question for this poem is, how does Hughes present his feelings towards his family in anniversary? So don't forget to, to leave a comment outlining some of your key point sentences, um, and, and we can get into a good discussion ahead of any upcoming exams. Um, so thank you very much for watching. I do hope this video helps you. Don't forget to like and subscribe, especially as I start working on a mini series for essay writing, um, which will help you to get your A stars in your GCSEs. So thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye guys.